Boule de Suif by Guy de Maupassant Part 3 The women drew together. They lowered their voices, and the discussion became general, each giving his or her opinion. But the conversation was not in the least coarse. The ladies, in particular, were adepts at delicate phrases and charming subtleties of expression to describe the most improper things. A stranger would have understood none of their allusions, so guarded was the language they employed. But seeing that the thin veneer of modesty with which every woman of the world is furnished goes but a very little way below the surface, they began rather to enjoy this unedifying episode, and at bottom were hugely delighted, feeling themselves in their element, furthering the schemes of lawless love with the gusto of a gourmand cook who prepares supper for another. Their gaiety returned of itself, so amusing at last did the whole business seem to them. The Count uttered several rather risky witticisms, but so tactfully were they said that his audience could not help smiling. Loiseau, in turn, made some considerably broader jokes, but no one took offense, and the thought expressed with such brutal directness by his wife was uppermost in the minds of all. Since it's the girl's trade, why should she refuse this man more than another? Dainty Madame Carlamadon seemed to think even that in Boule de Suif's place she would be less inclined to refuse him than another. The blockade was as carefully arranged as if they were investing a fortress. Each agreed on the role which he or she was to play, the arguments to be used, the maneuvers to be executed. They decided on the plan of campaign, the stratagems they were to employ, and the surprise attacks which were to reduce this human citadel and force it to receive the enemy within its walls. But Cornudet remained apart from the rest taking no share in the plot. So absorbed was the attention of all that Boule de Suif's entrance was almost unnoticed. But the Count whispered a gentle, Hush! which made the others look up. She was there. They suddenly stopped talking, and a vague embarrassment prevented them for a few moments from addressing her. But the Countess, more practiced than the others in the wiles of the drawing-room, asked her, was the baptism interesting? The girl, still under the stress of emotion, told what she had seen and heard, described the faces, the attitudes of those present, and even the appearance of the church. She concluded with the words, It does one good to pray sometimes. Until lunchtime, the ladies contented themselves with being pleasant to her, so as to increase her confidence and make her amenable to their advice. As soon as they took their seats at table, the attack began. First, they opened a vague conversation on the subject of self-sacrifice. Ancient examples were quoted. Judith and Holofernes, then, irrationally enough, Lucrece and Sextus. Cleopatra and the hostile generals whom she reduced to abject slavery by a surrender of her charms. Next was recounted an extraordinary story, born of the imagination of these ignorant millionaires, which told how the matrons of Rome seduced Hannibal, his lieutenants, and all his mercenaries at Capua. They held up to admiration all those women who from time to time have arrested the victorious progress of conquerors, made of their bodies a field of battle, a means of ruling, a weapon who have vanquished by their heroic caresses hideous or detested beings, and sacrificed their chastity to vengeance and devotion. All was said with due restraint and regard for propriety, the effect heightened now and then by an outburst of forced enthusiasm calculated to excite emulation. A listener would have thought at last that the one role of woman on earth was a perpetual sacrifice of her person, a continual abandonment of herself to the caprices of a hostile soldiery. The two nuns seemed to hear nothing, and to be lost in thought. Boule de Suif also was silent. During the whole afternoon she was left to her reflections. But instead of calling her Madame, as they had done hitherto, her companions addressed her simply as Mademoiselle, 
without exactly knowing why, but as if desirous of making her descend a step in the esteem she had won, and forcing her to realize her degraded position. Just as soup was served, Monsieur Follenvie reappeared, repeating his phrase of the evening before. The Prussian officer sends to ask if Mademoiselle Elizabeth Rousset has changed her mind. Boule de Suif answered briefly, No, monsieur. But at dinner the coalition weakened. Loiseau made three unfortunate remarks. Each was cudgeling his brains for further examples of self-sacrifice, and could find none. When the countess, possibly without ulterior motive, and moved simply by a vague desire to do homage to religion, began to question the elder of the two nuns on the most striking facts in the lives of the saints. Now it fell out that many of these had committed acts which would be crimes in our eyes, but the Church readily pardons such deeds when they are accomplished for the glory of God or the good of mankind. This was a powerful argument, and the Countess made the most of it. Then, whether by reason of a tacit understanding, a thinly veiled act of complacence such as those who wear the ecclesiastical habit excel in, or whether merely as the result of sheer stupidity, a stupidity admirably adapted to further their designs, the old nun rendered formidable aid to the conspirator. They had thought her timid. She proved herself bold, talkative, bigoted. She was not troubled by the ins and outs of casuistry. Her doctrines were as iron bars. Her faith knew no doubt. Her conscience no scruples. She looked on Abraham's sacrifice as natural enough, for she herself would not have hesitated to kill both father and mother if she had received a divine order to that effect. And nothing, in her opinion, could displease our Lord, provided the motive were praiseworthy. The Countess, putting to good use the consecrated authority of her unexpected ally, led her on to make a lengthy and edifying paraphrase of that axiom enunciated by a certain school of moralists. The end justifies the means. Then, sister, she asked, you think God accepts all methods and pardons the act when the motive is pure? Undoubtedly, madame, an action reprehensible in itself often derives merit from the thought which inspires it. And in this wise they talked on, fathoming the wishes of God, predicting His judgments, describing Him as interested in matters which assuredly concern Him but little. All was said with the utmost care and discretion, but every word uttered by the holy woman in her nun's garb weakened the indignant resistance of the courtesan. Then the conversation drifted somewhat and the nun began to talk of the convents of her order, of her superior, of herself, and of her fragile little neighbor, Sister St. Nikifor. They had been sent from Havre to nurse the hundreds of soldiers who were in hospitals, stricken with smallpox. She described these wretched invalids and their malady, and while they themselves were detained on their way by the caprices of the Prussian officer, scores of Frenchmen might be dying whom they would otherwise have saved. For the nursing of soldiers was the old nun's specialty. She had been in the Crimea, in Italy, in Austria, and as she told the story of her campaigns, she revealed herself as one of those holy sisters of the fife and drum, who seemed designed by nature to follow camps, to snatch the wounded from amid the strife of battle, and to quell with a word, more effectually than any general, the rough and insubordinate troopers. A masterful woman, her seamed and pitted face itself an image of the devastations of war. No one spoke when she had finished, for fear of spoiling the excellent effect of her words. As soon as the meal was over, the travelers retired to their rooms, whence they emerged the following day at a late hour of the morning. Luncheon passed off quietly. The seed sown the preceding evening was being given time to germinate and bring forth fruit. In the afternoon the Countess proposed a walk. Then the Count, as had been arranged beforehand, took Bull the